What is legacy code? Why is it nothing to do with age, hosting, or technology stack? Why is it more than COBOL, Fortran, or that Java monolith that you've always had lying around? And why do you need to learn to love your legacy systems? Hello, and welcome to the channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do that now. That way you can stay up to date with all the cool stuff that's happening here. I'm Steve Smith, I'm Cornish, and I'm the Global Head of Modernization and Platforms at Equal Experts. I'll be your host for today. I'm afraid Dave Farley isn't available. He's lost a bet to me, again, so he's had to go and steal a fire engine for my dog's birthday party. Legacy code isn't inherently good or inherently bad. It can be hard to describe. People want to understand the context surrounding the software before they really talk about it. They'll say things like, I know it when I see it. In 2004, Mike Feather's book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, came out. It was a seminal work because Mike provocatively defined legacy code as code without tests. This was an entirely new way of thinking about legacy code. Before that, it was simply about how old is it? How outdated is it? How obsolete is it? Mike's definition resonated with a lot of practitioners, including me, especially his advocacy for test driving in legacy systems. I actually met Mike in 2017 at a conference. I was a little bit starstruck, but luckily we just talked about bacon. So that was fine. In 2022, Dave interviewed Mike for his engineering room series, which I've always loved. Mike talked about the importance of using tests as a feedback mechanism in legacy systems. He said, every time you encounter a testability problem, there's actually a design problem lurking. And I couldn't agree more with that. In my job now, I spend a lot of time talking with practitioners, managers, and senior leaders in enterprise organizations. And legacy systems are a topic that come up time and time again. We're extremely fortunate on this channel to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, and Topple. Tuple builds software to make pair programming easier for people who work remotely. All of these companies, though, offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, please do click on the links in the description to below to check them out and support our sponsors. I'd like to extend Mike's definition slightly on what legacy code is and isn't. A colleague of mine, Ollie Shaw has come up with a tweaked definition. A legacy system is any software system with a high cost of business change. And as demand for business change increases, it can't respond quickly and safely. Change can't be sustained in a legacy system. Eventually, something or someone will break. We can visualize this in a two by two. Everyone loves a two by two, right? In the Y axis, we have cost of business change. So that puts our legacy systems at the top. And on the x-axis, we have demand for business change. So the dangerous legacy systems, the ones you should worry about most, are in the top right, where there's high demand for change and a high cost of change. Modern services can cope with low or high demand. They've got continuous delivery baked into them. They have an inherently low cost of change. If you've done all of that stuff well, then there's nothing to worry about. And with your legacy systems, if there's a low cost of change, you might be okay for a while. You might get away with it as long as they're reliable and performant and supplying value add to your customers. Of course, if they aren't doing those things, then you should stop watching this video right now and go and fix that. When legacy systems have high demand, you've got a serious problem because you can't make changes safely and quickly on a continual basis. The delays in coding, testing and deploying, the inevitable failures, the inevitable rework will all have a really significant impact on your time to value. You'll be creating a business bottleneck. This is why legacy systems are nothing to do with age, technology or hosting stack. A legacy system could be on-premise or in the cloud. It could be six months old or six years old. It could be Fortran or f -sharp. It could be AI free or 100% AI native. And yes, I've already seen legacy systems that were generated entirely through Cursor or Windsurf. Here are some badly anonymized examples. A Dutch pensions company built amazing React frontends on top of an ICO COBOL mainframe that people simply didn't want to touch. That's because it was a variant of ICO COBOL that only 10 engineers in the world truly understood because it had been built up over so many decades. And of those 10 engineers, eight worked at the bank and were on very good salaries 
One was trying to retire and kept being given more money to stay. The bank refused to discuss this as a business risk. A British startup built an online food offering in only six months using Next.js and Lambdas on AWS. They churned out code as fast as they could to hit their launch date so they could secure more funding. They succeeded. Everything's good, right? But unfortunately, the moment after launch, they found that they couldn't make changes to functionality without breaking the system. They couldn't move as fast as they needed to for business demand. This caused some really serious ructions in the company. There were exec changes, and ultimately, the decision was made to call for a rewrite. And an American manufacturer embarked on a digital transformation. They made the extremely wise decision to split their engineering team in two. The Eagles team doing the new stuff, and the legacy team doing the old stuff. The very next day, a sign appeared above the legacy team's desk pointing down at them, and it read, the money-making team. Okay, so where does engineering excellence fit into all of this? Everything becomes a legacy system unless you proactively invest in it. If you've built a modern service recently, you'll need to make gradual, steady improvements to it to protect that cost of business change. Don't rush to rewrite a legacy system. I know that rewrites are like super exciting, but you should only do it if the cost of change is enormous and the demand for change is high for the medium to long term. Of course, if a legacy system is horribly unreliable or unperformant, then that's a different conversation. But a rewrite should always be your last resort because it will always take longer and cost more than you tell yourself. I've been there. All the ways you need to improve a legacy system day to day are in Dave's book, Modern Software Engineering. All of the principles and practices you need are available there. You don't need to improve everything everywhere all at once. Just find the parts of your legacy system that are under regular pressure where demand is usually focused and seek to improve those areas. And remember what Mike Feather said, testability is a design lens. If it's hard to test your legacy system, you should listen to your tests, understand where the design problems are and gradually seek to resolve them. And learn to love your legacy systems. Respect for what's come before you is an essential ingredient in your journey, in your growth as an engineer. Not all legacy systems need rewriting. They need just managing. If they're supplying value out and they're not on fire, they're going to be paying your salary for months or years to come. For more on this topic, see some of Emily or Trisha's videos on this channel. They're both better engineers than I ever was. Next time I'm here, I'll cover another engineering topic. But before that, Dave has to get that fire engine to my dog's birthday party on time. That dog's always wanted to be a firefighter. Thanks for watching.